So how long did you guys have amazing lettuce? Inside. Yeah, I mean, for the first year or two, I mean, you get more more than you need. Like, for the mushrooms, I mean, you get tired of them because, I mean, that tower <laughs> produced, like, I, I think, well, I'll give you the exact numbers, but, I mean, I had mush I would eat mushrooms, like, every day with eggs, and it's, like, you get tired of because <laughs> mushrooms are quite, it is quite productive. It's, yeah, I mean, the kind of promises, I, I think they're all real in terms of the yields. And yeah, like it's really nice to take get that salad. You got your whether it's it's your kale. Kale is so easy to grow. The Chinese cabbage so easy. Lettuce is good. Uh, at the end of the day, what happens if you throw some mint in there? Mint is gonna take over the whole greenhouse. So at the very very end, what we had was towers of mint because they would actually spread from one tower to the next and just start growing. Um, <coughs> Out of curiosity, the yeah. pest that you mentioned, um, that you were yeah. with, is uh, the, the source of them primarily the, uh, <coughs> the soil that you brought in, you know? Or it's the it's air. So one of these systems, they're actually hermetically sealed from the environment, so it's like bug screen. Um, that's important because you'll get things like the cabbage moths, they're all around here, but they'll just come in and eat it up, just destroy your, your crop. However, the cabbage moths, so those kinds of things are easily done, easily gotten rid of by BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a mixture, you mix that in water and spray, and man, you just spray like for a few days and they completely go away and you're good again. But yeah, like the bugs that come out from the outside, that's the thing. As far as in soil, um, I mean, there'll be different things. Like for example, fungus gnats got into the nut crop, so we had to actually spray it with, with fungicide because uh, basically like all the roots started getting eaten up by these little gnats, these little little worms. And then, yeah, we had to take measures on that. Otherwise, like the whole crop would be just eaten up. Uh, and you're talking about intensive culture. We had 8,000 plants in there. Like actually, in fact, 10. 10,000 nuts in these 100 trays. It was like 100, yeah, about 100 of these trays. We, we have them. Uh, they're all stacked in an old greenhouse. These trays where you put in the, these deep pots for the nuts. So if you talk about intensive, yeah, uh, you're going to have to watch watch stuff, watch what happens, uh, kind of be on top of it. And then, yeah, and that's the kind of information that needs to be captured. Like, okay, what's this proven kind of a uh, system that um, that works well? <laughs> Okay, let's try that. Let's try that again. So going going back to so on the wiki, this is called aquaponic greenhouse. That's if you dig into those pages. Um, there's thousands of pages of info there, and thousands of pictures. And th this made me think. It's like, you know, we're doing what we can, but. Like if somebody is gets serious and wants to write this Bible of it and do a good manual, I mean all the content is there, but it would really take time for somebody to parse it and make sense of it. But but it's all there, like from CAD, BOM, build instructions, data collection, logs, pictures, videos, and everything. It's it's all there. Um, let's finish up this video here. So mushroom ponds, tilapia, square foot space, and glue. Yeah, so after we did this, we can show all this, and this is all real. Two round ponds, tilapia fish, chat, sorry. I'll share that screen. Um. Who put that video together for you? Put the what? D who did the video? It's a, it's I did it. Nice. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. We built our first aquaponic greenhouse last year. All the nuts on the side. It's an 800 square foot space that includes two in ground ponds, tilapia fish, chickens, hydronic heating, growing towers, growing beds, warm tap. Both came from there. Uh, these, uh, uh, this thing that we had a little tower of uh, potato. Yeah, I mean, you need space for that. That was kind of hard to do. But yeah, chicken eggs, plenty of that. Growing beds, 
So hydronics, we connected the house heating to the aquaponic greenhouse, so the ha same house heat, you'd actually feed that into the pond through a 100-foot coil of PEX, <laughs> PEX tubing like this, and that was the Bar towers, towers, mushrooms. Yeah, I mean, this what? stuff, once this starts growing, it's just amazing. I mean, look at that. You put rotten straw in there, you seed it up, and these amazingly beautiful mushrooms vertical growing shells cover it and it uh, so that's You're an example to. so that's an example of aquaponics on rafts, not ours, somebody brought that actually to show. And we're uh, going to do it again this so fall. So we're doing a module. Join us in this workshop to learn how to build, equip, and maintain an open source so greenhouse. That was the team. Greenhouse. <laughs> Early bird discount on our aquaponic greenhouse <laughs> workshop. <laughs> so that was for that was for the Kickstarter campaign where we had like yeah a whole bunch of people show up for that build, um, which is now Katarina's, which is now converted to a pool. Uh, because for health issues she needs to swim. We're actually going to take the the glazing from that. We're going to recycle. She's going to upgrade that to clear gra glazing. Um, but for the the aquaponic greenhouse, you want the translucent double wall, which is insulating. Uh, I'll talk more about it because that's 3D printable. I'll show you how we pr 3D printed that in, in our log of uh, pictures. So where's where's the pictures? Where are the pictures? So uh, if you go to... I indexed, the, I just searched for aquaponic greenhouse pictures in Google Drive, and this is what came up. So this is the working doc, once again. Uh, you can get it off my log. Photos. Okay, let's look at some of the things that we have done and what's real. Um, okay, you can get, get duckweed growing in there like crazy. Uh, now the fish, that means there's no fish in there, because they would eat it all up. So that was a time like when we seeded some duckweed and uh, the fish weren't, it's either like, um, we had a couple of, yeah, like, oh man, everything, like all kinds of disaster, like whole pond. We had two ponds so that if one dies, you got the other. And that happened one time. One time we left the water on. Water has chloramine. Chloramine kills fish. That was left on all night. All the fish went belly up in that pond and that's where we got the duckweed after that. Was it uh, tap water? Tap right? water. Okay. So actually when we pour the water into the greenhouse we have to either wait like a day or two or put some vitamin C in there which kills off the chloramine uh, chemical that's the purifier. So in Europe they apparently do ozone and we're gonna do that. We have an option to do that uh, ozone system here too because we wanted to if there's time I'm not, not sure if there's gonna be time but it, Part of the thing was exploring the, the idea of a closed loop water system because if you think about what a closed loop water system is, already in our first house we have the macerating toilet which goes to a biodigester. So as I mentioned, the biodigester effluent is already plant grade fertilizer. So if you feed that into the towers, then you've got quality of water that's into the towers, into the fish ponds, through grow beds, you already have uh, like fish safe water you can take that fish safe water and um, I would say that if you put an ozonator to that you kill off all the biological material and some of the live stuff will just settle out which you can readily filter through a small filter like a pool filter so from that pending sufficient retention time within the with the ozone you've got potable water starting from your toilet so I think that kind of integration can happen relatively easily and will require only two of the totes, the 250-gallon IBC totes, like they do for bulk fluid shipping, uh, that kind of volume. So biodigester, at least one, and at least one purifying tank and, and some filters. But that, I think, can sustain two people for a completely closed-loop water system. You can look at the numbers and calculations and that's actually supposed to be sufficient according to the numbers as well. How okay. do you uh, monitor that to make sure that the, it's getting clean? Well, you'd, you'd, have, you'd, have to do, you'd have to do your water. You'd have to have a system to test the water. Uh, yeah. I mean, you do regular tests, and a lot of those tests are not open source, but there are different devices like spectrometers, open source spectrometers, water test kits. Um, you have to just go through the procedure and, and open sourcing all those procedures because a lot of that... Typically, you just send stuff off to a lab. You don't really know how it's done. Um, so open sourcing that whole procedure for how you actually measure everything 
and having open source tools like Arduinos and loggers that do that for you would be a great value add to the entire ecosystem of this project that's bigger than any one person. So um, there you go. Do you know how often you have to test to make it? All the time. Viable so have it, have it a lot. Have an automated logging system that you can log into your computer. Here's here's your dashboard and here's your uh, measurements. You'd want to do it real time. You want to monitor. And we've done a bunch of that. I'll show what we have done in terms of here. So here, this is what happens after after three years of neglect. Everything dies off except for the mint. Mojitos. <laughs> <laughs> So you've got a mint business right here, <laughs> but if you notice, like on the sides there, that's when that's a couple of years. This stuff, that's where all the nuts were growing there on the shelves, which were bottom watered with these special 3D printed fittings. I'll show you. Uh, where actually 3D printing came very useful because there's no. I'll, I'll show you that, but it's an example of where no no fitting off the shelf would do the function that we needed. Uh, the function was to fill and weep out. So fill without spilling, so it fills and drains through a big hole, and you don't want your plant sitting in water, so you do that for one hour, and it weeps out a small weep hole. So that little custom fitting we had to 3D print, I'll show you what that is. But this is your, uh, your mint business. Uh, so look at some of the things that happened. This, this is the oyster mushroom. It's self-seeded, like on, on the rotting wood of the greenhouse. Mm. Uh, things mm -hmm. like that start to happen, because you've got now all this stuff growing in there because we grew the mushrooms in there and they I guess put out some spores and did that um, we had a banana plant in there so you see like the mint starting to take over but that's like uh, sweet potato that will just climb all over the place um, that's what it looks like draining to the bottom into the the ponds uh, let's see so this was the the first hydroponic greenhouse and in that system the mint is actually not mint this is basil is quite resistant to the bugs much more than the lettuce so all the lettuce got killed off and the basil took over the entire greenhouse and this was in tubs I'll show more pictures of that uh, hillbilly heater like water heating through solar so this is like towards the latter years like probably year two or three where you see like the mint starting to take over and then uh, tomatoes that self seed all over the place and stuff like that um, but this is what you get all the time and it's so beautiful so look at this what's that little critters like the tilapia just self seed self replicate all the time so you'd always have like a new stock and if you don't protect these they'll get eaten up by the big fish but it's a perpetual system so you've got fish of all ages in there and as long as these have some protective area where the big fish can't eat them, that will live forever. We had a cage submerged with mesh so that they, the little fish could go in there and and survive. So we had basically fish of all all ages in the same pond. Otherwise, it would be just like one age where the big ones just eat the small ones. That's, that's what happens. Um, but that would just happen all the time naturally. Uh, and it's such a great sight because you'd see this whole cloud. Like they come in like hundred clouds. That's just a few of them there. But a lot of times when they're first born, it's a it's a cloud. It's a bunch of bunch of caviar, <laughs> and then it turns into little fish. So like right there, what that tells me, it's like well yeah, their family was eaten, gobbled up by other fish because there's only like ten of them right there. Um, so things like these climbing tomatoes would just take over the whole thing. Uh, they're a pain to pick because they're so tiny. Like one of them, you have to pick one, and they're just a little cherry. So maybe grow grow bigger ones. But yeah, they'd be just climbing. That's like some cilantro and towers. Um, carrots. Yeah, you could do t do carrots. Like you could. This is where deep beds come in. Like you have to have soil beds for this. This won't grow in your tower. Uh, so we had. I mean, literally those pots there uh, that grew the carrots. And that's great. Uh, chicory that. I don't know where that came from. I, I think actually, yeah, we planted it. Actually, we did plant it. So that's blooms of uh, sweet potato. Um, so keep going through. But th these kind of clumps, we just collect this all the time, and the thing would just grow back again. Like, I mean, just insane. So that's kale. Uh, so the reality is this: the the red guys are good. We buy them. 
and, uh, and release them. And what you see there, you see a bunch of like this, this darkened damage from aphids. So those little white things are body bags of aphids, like just sucked out aphids. But, the <laughs> but these, you release a bunch of these and the aphids completely go away. So, so this, that's awesome. And then you have to think about, well, how do I keep the ladybugs around? So uh, they kind of tend to, they would go into the walls and, and come back sometimes. Sometimes they would just completely like disappear. Uh, after like a few months, they'll just completely go away and maybe die off or something. Um, so that's a decent sight. Are they um, are they dependent on the aphids to to stick around or? Probably you have to give them some some kind of food. Yeah. Whoever, um, whatever they eat. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, things like that. That's. Uh, oh man, and these things actually grow very well. These are called. Uh, not tom they're not tomatillos. They're they're. Oh, I forget the name, but they're they're definitely not tomatillos. They're they're very sweet, nice fruit. This is really awesome, full of nutrients. It's you a super food. Um, ground cherry. Oh yeah. I believe that's it. Yeah. And those are, they're quite tasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so they grow like crazy. They'll just take all over, start going all over the place. Um, they look like this. So, yeah, okay, so here's building, like typically what we did we, is we would go in ground. So we make a big hole. This is the, the second workshop we're actually di first you back hold the hole we started with two but if you have two holes and you drain one there's a lot of ground pressure so the ponds would collapse so we went to one because sometime you're gonna make a mistake and drain the pond unless you have a foolproof system which may not exist because someone will find a way to drain it. I mean we left a pump all night or well I mean the way to avoid that is suspend the pump at the top so it can only pump to pump at the top well but that's not foolproof because if that pump drops by mistake or something, you know, you'll suck out your whole pond if it's an automated system, if you're not. What so here, the what was the depth? five feet, four feet, four or five, four to five feet. What if you built rigid walls? Yeah, and that's what we ended up doing. So we did, so first we do a system like this. We put gravel on a side, we put insulation. You see what starting there is rigid walls with long rebars stuck into the ground. And that's pretty solid. Then we also put, these uh, so we're starting this solid edge, but that's not that can fail too. Uh, so here's more of what it looks like later on. So these longer strips that hold it together, but unless you run it all the way down, you still have a lot of ground pressure, like at the lower part. So you still have, but you see those things like the top's not going to collapse. So you're going to stabilize the top first. But if you were to accidentally drain this pond, yeah. Uh, this this could collapse at the bottom you or need like a stucco or something like that you need something we did just wood treated wood mm -hmm. and boards to do that um, but here we're that's how we were preparing the the actual pond and you're nailing these these heavy nails rebar just rebar spikes with a washer welded on top and that's quite solid um, but for lifetime design, I mean, soil moves around. I mean, it's clay underneath there. If you have, say, like a super wet year and a, it's all like wet down there. Okay, I guess we were, went into the night here. Um, yeah, uh, so building building wall, uh, roof modules, so filling. So they're using the CEBs um, to do that? If they're stabilized, you can do stabilized CEBs, and that would be a good application for CEBs. Oh, for the wall. Yeah. Um, and here's how we install the modules. Once again, the you build all the ones in the workshop, and here we're starting to install them one by one. Here we're going to, in this workshop, we're going to just work. So here's a dedicated foundation. But um, what we can do is just a stem wall, just, just a sill plate, or even right on a concrete. On the, we have to, we're gonna, since the house is not down yet, we're going to have to build behind the house. Maybe we can do more of taking down the house, which, by the way, yesterday, three, three hours and 40 minutes to take off the roof joists and second floor uh, and it took us one hour 15 minutes to take down the walls which is the same time it took us to put up the first story walls which means that there were some snags which means 
like finding screws, like there was a bunch of screws that were driven so deep we couldn't find them, stuff like that. Um, so if you're doing a greenhouse like this, uh, there's insulation there, so we want to keep it year round. Um, the re track record for winter, only on a super cold days like negative 10 would it freeze over and actually kill the plants. There's a couple of days where it goes that low, but in the winter, well, that's only if you, if you don't heat it. If you heat it, we had the hydronic heat, yeah, you, we just kept it alive all, all winter and uh, running the whole time. So that's some of the build here, you can see. So we'll be doing this. We'll be doing the, these kinds of walls um, as far as the current build. And the floor had already been backhoed by that point, right? Yeah, before you, before you uh, put up the walls, right, so that backhoe has to, or the excavator has to have gotten in there already. But it so wasn't supported yet, right? Because I saw wasn't the supported. Walls. Okay, okay. wasn't supported at all. You can dig relatively accurately with a backhoe but then you gotta support it, otherwise it will collapse like, and it won't collapse for a long time, and maybe never if you keep the water in there, but if you have accidents. Because uh, in this green greenhouse here, we would pump, uh, what would we pump? We would pump into the towers, but if you had like some broken thing, or actually, um, oh yeah, we were watering plants in, in the shelves, and then we, or like the nuts that we had a bunch of trays, we moved them outside, we were watering it and forgot to turn the, turn the pump off. But here's the, the shelf. So what happens with the shelf? So these are actually uh, treated lumber and you have some, um, that's still in the old greenhouse there, covered with polyethylene. And they actually, we water the top and they drain from the top shelf to the bottom and so forth uh, back to the pond. So how do you do that? So that that's kind of some of it there. We here we were growing some peppers, but we started with all those those nuts, um, which we then planted out with our funky keyline plow machine that we built over a few days. Um, but you know, operationally, like yeah, that's all the hazelnuts growing. Like we had this one growing bed and so forth. Um, Okay, 3D printing. So yeah, here's like your tree frogs will start going in there, which is good. Um, you'll have these guys. These are not good. That's the cabbage moths, and they'll just eat up. They they eat up everything, and I'll just completely crush your crop, like from lettuce to to kale. Uh, yeah, they'll just eat everything. So these guys are cool. Um, Do these eat the others? Yeah, they gotta eat something. So, I mean, that's how it looks. Like it'll look like that, and then before soon, like the whole leaf is gone, and these things turn into butterflies. These white butterflies. Um, yeah, frogs would like them. Uh, here's planting out these things, these nuts afterwards in the fields. That's where you see the white stakes. That's actually breeding grade crop. Um, for so that's the funky machine we did that with. We, we built this uh, tractor thing. Um, okay, what else to show? There's plenty to show. Let's see, uh, there's that. Um, that's our key line plow thing, thingy that we did for, uh, so it's a tractor with tracks and it has a flail mower so it kind of kicks down the weeds and then cuts this key line. Uh, that's, that was the device we built there, um, showing when it was like really wet. We were planting the nuts like that. Um, so that was what the machine looked like going into the field. Uh, it's a 54 horsepower is track that what device. The sticks are for to mark the trees? Yeah, yeah. So that's breeding, breeding grade hazelnuts from um, Badger Set Research where they're they're actually breeding hazel. So this is like a few days. We spent like two days to build that thing with a key line. Uh, that's the finished moth like that's that's what they look like if you see one of these your crop is gone within like two weeks um, so a bunch of this that's cherries from elsewhere <coughs> that's the greenhouse uh, some aerials there it's pretty cool okay it's taking time to load but yeah had some aerials that's a um, Phil Rudder from Batter said he's the nut guy 
but he's breeding these hazelnuts. Basically, the concept there is for hazelnuts and chestnuts to be a replacement for corn and soybeans as perennial crops, because uh, hazelnuts have all the kind of protein that you typically get from from soy, and chestnuts have the type of starch that you typically typically get from corn, and those are perennial crops. The trick is, like right now, the the chestnuts produce enough that they're a commercial crop. The hazelnuts don't outside of places like Seattle, like Washington State, Oregon, where they grow hazelnuts. But here they've got issues with in the Midwest with uh, blight, all kinds of disease. So this guy's breeding them, Phil's breeding them, and we're actually got that stock here. So we've got like out of that whole crop, we've got 30 plants left out of 10,000, and that is as soon as we planted them, the rabbits took them out <laughs> just as quick and only a few lone survivors made it. You gotta protect them, definitely tree guards. We thought we could do it, um, but in order to do it, you'd have to pretty much clean mow, like very nice and neat mow the entire field so that there are no rabbits because hawks, they, rabbits will not go where there's empty space because they'll get picked off by hawks. So he did put up some hawk roosts, but that didn't, too much rabbit pressure. So but those 30 that are alive are they're actually breeding grade stock that's the best in the world that's the latest breeding stuff so it's actually some of that is going on here we're going to redo this this is important this is work that's on a hundred year time scale just like soybeans came from no yield to extremely high yields over the last decade here we're doing this with swarm breeding of hazels and chest chestnuts are already there but hazels which are perennials so they don't take one year to grow they take five years to fruit up so your cycles are longer but you do huge massive plant outs and soon enough they start breeding true so this is not hybridizing things this is called swarm breeding natural selection selection of the fittest the ones that are adapting so it's sexual propagation of the nuts meaning they cross-pollinate as opposed to the industry standard where you take a great one and you propagate it so it's and it's a biological dead end mm -hmm. because very soon you're going to have pests that get that eat it up and the thing has no protection because it's not evolving genetically so it's one of those things that society right now you, you can do the short-term gain of the hybrids but we'd like to do everything like think about like all the apples cherries whatever whatever you got most of the stuff you got is patented hybrids like the stuff you get from stark brothers sorry you can't propagate this <laughs> you can't even plant your own seeds first of all they wouldn't come true second it's not legal to clone them like by cuttings uh cuttings and propagating them so natural selection is where you do the swarm breeding where the things adapt as a it's pretty much like open source where you have a swarm of people and you kind of select for the best. What sticks sticks. What sticks <laughs> sticks. Mm -hmm. How old the are the kind of thing. cheese and how tall are they? Uh, they're like this <laughs> big on the field and they're, they're, um, this was 2016. So five years, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So that's, yeah, that's interesting stuff. But we're going to redo this because this is important work as in like here you got some agriculture, manufacturing all that an integrated facility that does all these kinds of things it's the kind of stuff that everyone did before like a long time ago people would just select like Johnny Appleseed would plant seeds that he collected um, and people would do the heirlooms which basically are se seeds selected that come true that are good varieties but they still improve over time because they're they're propagating through pollen not through cloning like genetic cloning or just cutting cloning so uh, yeah, so that's that's an important story there. Um, just FYI, the way we planted that, what you have to do because it's so hot, you have to strip off all the leaves and the new leaves when you plant them out. That's the actual technique that works. Like, because it's so hot when you plant them in July, you got to take off all the leaves, you shed, <laughs> and then just leave a couple. So this stuff starts to seed out and it doesn't get fried by the sun. So that's that's kind of like the real real uh, practice of it from Phil. Um, all right, so there's some technique. So yeah, th these are the the pots. Um, those pots that uh, it turns out that in the towers that we make, a little little discovery. Th those 
deep pots fit exactly into the holes we have on the towers. So it's like, oh cool, let's actually use them. So a cool automated technique would be plant the seeds and plant into those and then put them into the towers. The much more advanced thing would be you have your little aerial drones that uh, that, prop that take your little seedling and put it into the tower. That's much more complicated with, with computer vision and stuff like that. But an easy interim is using FarmBot, uh, basically the automated seeder from the FarmBot open source project, to do the seeding in a controlled tray like these. You know, I get a hundred of them. Because the long part is it's, it's a second to put them into the slot in a tower. But to plant it, plant out all the seeds, keep watering that, that's, that's the time-taking thing. So if you talk about an economically efficient operation that makes like a hundred bucks an hour for your labor, yeah, that's doable there. If, if you've got, you're selling, say, uh, a thousand plants a month and you put in like 15 minutes to plant it, like it takes a few seconds, one second, you got your tray, you can do that, that whole planting in, a, I guess, a couple of hours. Um, probably like two hours, if you have the ready plants, then you harvest. You can actually take out all the pots, put them back into the, the trays, and take them to market like that. You can be taking a, doing that, so if you're growing, like say, a thousand of them per month at like two hours of labor plus market time, I mean, that's a great business, if you've got that to that level. So then there's a huge amount of knowledge you have to have to do that, and some tech, but it's cool because I mean efficiency. You got if you you could either be doing this all the time or do this very effectively uh, as a reliable business. But for that, there's efficiencies that are required, just like in any enterprise. But the point is that this can compete with anything that's the best out there, right? So uh, if you talk about competing with robots, well, you're getting robot assist here, so you are part of an automated world, and it's still appropriate because it's open source and and low-cost accessible if you make this based on Arduinos and universal axes and stuff like that. Okay, um, so yep. Do they stay in their pipe as they're playing? No, 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 we take them out. Uh, yeah, that would kill the roots off. Yeah, we only right. got the... There's a watering hole at the bottom, so these, these rest in trays, and that's why we needed to build all those trays in the greenhouse so that more machines, so that's, that's how the thing looked when we took it out there. Um, Here's our promo pictures of some exterior trim work in preparation. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, so you decapitate these nuts in, um, in a greenhouse and then they start doing that and then you plant them out in a field. But yeah, like this stuff, that's, that's a joyous sight there. Uh, all the little baby fish, um, flail mower, cherries. Um, <clears throat> but let's talk about some <clears throat> more maybe um, so those were the the chestnuts we were planting out yeah I mean crazy crazy stuff um, this is how your trays of plants look like these hundred trays um, a little strawberries they these strawberries are pretty good too strawberries actually grow extreme like oh man look at this did you ever see aquaponic straw like hydroponic strawberry did you ever google that mm -hmm. You're going to love this. <laughs> this is what we can do. Uh, what? Hydroponic. So I think you could do the aquaponic greenhouse just for the sake of this. <laughs> Look at that. Like that kind of stuff. That's, that's what they do. This lends itself very well. They actually grow very well in um, aquaponics or hydroponics. So... Is that enough inspiration? Really easy to pick too. Yeah, like if you set it up, I mean, this you know, you go in there and it's literally your Garden of Eden there. Just eat them. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, or they do this stuff. But everywhere it's got to be like, you got to use the vertical space. Well, here they do it overhead so it's super easy to pick. Once again, kind of using the, the vertical. And that's like a few grown in a, in a growing bed with some onions and other things in there so would like would like to have more of that crap now these are the classic pictures with a full plant out of everything like those nuts nuts on the ground the growing bed um, so we took a bunch of pictures of that 
Uh, that's the greenhouse that's in front of Jeff's house when it was a couple of years ago. Um, Both of the beams what? there are, uh, are sorry, no coconuts. Uh, the, the bent. I was curious, like, what, what made the bend? Was it the moisture? The bends the what? The, in the just uh, house, the overhead beam. Oh, yeah. Have bent. Okay. Like, well, why does the bending happen? Oh, yeah, because that's uneven drying of treated lumber. It's mm -hmm. part, like, lumber, think about lumber and violins. They make violins out of straight lumber that's wetted and then curved into all, s all types of shapes. Wood does that. Mm -hmm. uh, so... So how would you prevent it? Because if, if you can't... You have to fix it. Fix it somehow. So first of all, 2x4 will do that like crazy. Like right now, if we did that, I wouldn't do 2x4s because they do that particularly badly. So like 2x6s would be more stable. Put like two screws and okay, so every two often. feet. Okay. Yeah, in that greenhouse we caught them every four feet. Right. The new design is every two feet now, okay. for other reasons too. Mm -hmm. um, if you have to buy two by fours, make sure you plan and join them, which will mean dedicated machines for that. But that that helps with that. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, he was the overhead um, hillbilly heater with 3D printed fittings and chestnuts. We used that a little bit. Um, th these fittings actually ended up leaking, so we didn't. Continue. So little details like that. This wants to be uh, a better fit. Probably print them out of thermoplastic urethane rubber, which means that it'll be much more tight fit. Um, so here's how the chestnuts look, ones that we planted um, earlier. This was the what I mentioned about compost tea. But what you do is you get a bag, fill it with compost from your worm bed, and aerate uh, just bubble air through that and it gets this very nice biological mix that's a very good fertilizer so that's and it's also actually as a foliar spray it does have insecticidal properties so <coughs> what happens in nature like why don't you see everything eaten up in nature there's a complex web of microbes so whatever's growing in there that can be enough to kill some other things that want to eat your plants but in a bare system of say hydroponic lettuce like okay so take a look at what a hydroponic lettuce farm looks like lettuce production and it's like an acre of lettuce <laughs> and I can tell you man they got to be spraying the hell out of that stuff to make that happen or otherwise get a clean room environment because that will get eaten up pretty quickly it's a monoculture yeah. it's a mass monoculture that's intensely propagated well I think what they do is they they do it and completely spray it up kill off absolutely everything and then you've got a fresh environment and then you can do that for 30 days then you got to do it again so a lot of chemicals this is <laughs> intense chemical use unless it's organic and will that even exist so let's see organic hydroponic that's where you probably get into aquaponic because it's a more complex system organic hydroponic lettuce production maybe it does but one thing I noticed first is that the density is lower. I don't know how they do it. They, uh, they will have to release biological agents, so biological pesticides or bugs, to eat the things that would grow on this. If you're, or maybe there's, maybe they also, s the rules, I don't know what the rules are there, but maybe they're also allowed to spray in between, but nothing during. Uh, that may be like, I suspect something like that may exist because I know this is very hard. This is not easy stuff. Yeah, I uh, had a so hydroponic tower growing lettuce, and I had like three or four praying mantids on it at all times. And it's how'd you get them? them? How'd you get wow. the mantis? Uh, it was outside, so they just flew there. Awesome. I didn't, I didn't See, that's there. they just came over. That's nice, and we we had that too. Like I have a picture of a praying mantis, but yeah, that's a praying mantises eat other bugs, so that's.
cool. So that's a young little lettuce in there. Um, but already I see that. See that? That's an aphid shell. So, okay, so here's your water testing. Well, here you test for pH. Um, you want to be around, uh, I forget. I got the data on that, but, um, whoops. That's a crop of 3D printed parts and eggs <laughs> from multiple chickens. Mm -hmm. So they're actually different colors, like bluish, greenish, from the different chicks. We had all these heirloom chickens in there. Um, this is related, but that's that's not related almost. That's the, a forest, which is now like 10 or 20 feet, which was planted five years ago. A forest, that's a different story. Oh, look at this. So this is this is a uh, 3D printed. Oh, yeah. these guys are not good. What are they? I don't even. Know. I forget what they, those are. Um, the Japanese beetle. Oh yeah. So take a look at this. Towards multi-wall polycarbonate panels. This is 3D printed in PLA. This is transparent multi-wall glazing. Quite transparent. You can see pretty so much right printing. through. It's probably like 80% transparency or so. Moving forward to make it now in real size 4x8 foot sheets, so that's which that would be literally free if you weeks. say, for example, grind up uh, used CDs. Typically in a store, these are $50 for a 4x8 panel like this, and that's not, not counting things like triple or quadruple wall, which can be printed easily while it goes exponentially expensive when you buy that at the store. So let's see how this works with a large format 3D printer. That's going to be a project we're aiming to build these panels, print them for the November 2016 build of the seed home. Yeah, right. We did Towards multi-wall polycarbonate panels. This little one. Um, polycarbonate is 3D printable. That's the very hard glazing material. That's the actual multi-wall panels are made from polycarbonate. It's pretty much impact resistance. Um, yeah, but as far as insulating material, you can print multi-wall material with a 3D printer, which you cannot extrude. You cannot extrude these kinds of, you can do the, this linear kind of a structure through an extruder when it comes to actual bubbles inside the 3D printed material. Only 3D printing can do that. So this is some cool product development that can happen. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the, the bottom water trays and the 3D printed finnegans <coughs> that go there. So all this has to be sub it's impossible to water this from the top. That, let's start with that. Because the foliage is so thick that very little water gets down there and most of it just spills out the sides. So you got a bottom water and to do that, so here's the, the delivery hoses, but uh, the actual structure there is kind of interesting there. Um, let's show some of that. Um, not here yet. What is that guy? That guy's probably not good. More testing. How do you do these? Oh yeah, so that's uh, before you plant the hazelnuts, you keep them watered up for like a couple of weeks. Um, oh yeah, so 3D printed these little pots. So all the net pots we are using, that we 3D print those. Here's what happens like that's like neglected there but this is like where we got the outbreak of of uh, aphids and just got eaten up um, here's my knees he okay here's the let's see what we got oh here's how you do the BT that's Bacillus thuringiensis that's just the powder you put in water and you spray it with a sprayer uh, so that's kinda like when we were starting to plant out the nuts before we actually planted the towers before we hung the towers so once again the frogs are frogs there are good um, the so that's the bottom bottom watering in the trays no the frogs you actually bought to put in there or they just come in by themselves I already saw one in the CD go home too <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this guy who is that not a good guy I don't know who that is. Yeah, maybe. So this is the trick of the 3D printing. So this is 3D printed. Uh, this is a. This is actually very useful. So it's a thing that screws into the shelf from the top. The way it works, 
Um, do I have an explanation of that? So that's what it looks like from the bottom. So it's an overspill that's treated lumber for the growing beds. On the top, this is what it looks like. So if you overfill, it drains, but it doesn't keep the water there. What about all that height of two inches right now? There's a little weep hole at the bottom that allows that to escape over like an hour or two, like a couple of hours. Um, so that's that's what it, these things look like. Um, yeah, doc, that's all documented. Three files on online there, but um, that was a Lulzbot Mini printer before we really got off into our printers. Um, but this is what happens to a Lulzbot Mini when you destroy your heat bed by ramming the nozzle into it, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which can't happen in ours by design because we have a different design that we can't do that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to show that. See that? That's that's the weep hole. That's the secret there. All the water drains out of there. So it's a it's a it's a way to do this kind of an intensive plant out. Um, and here you see um, the root system. Here's the root system. Root system. Oh, you see that white thing? That's the fungus gnat. Is, that's the thing that because I saw these plants were dying off what's happened like these guys fungus gnats and that's when you know like all this thing you gotta watch out you gotta take some measures here's the compost tea where you're aerating it and it gets this nice brew of biological activity uh, that's your little brew bag so I got all this documented in terms of how, th how those shelves are made so it's just treated lumber with supports and then uh, hung with pipe pipe hanger um, what else? Now, uh, those plants, is that just regular soil they have in there in the... It's, um, it's specially prepared though. It's got more perlite in it, and it's got a little charcoal on top, and okay. it's got fungicide in it. Okay, it's, I was it's wondering if you uh, watered thought you'd like cocoa perlite or something like a cocoa noir or something like that. It's just completely for hydroponics without the regular soil. You can use, um, a lot of different media from perlite to regular soil you want a lot of aeration here we have to take some extra measures like for the dipping the whole tray in fungicide before planting the nuts because we know that the fungus gnats which actually eat the fungus that grows there but in the meantime they actually destroy your roots right. too um, the 3D printed thing with the we pull for the water where, yeah. did, where did that go? In the trace? It goes in a tray, so the tray sits on, on there where it would be under the tray. Under the um, PVC pipe looking stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, un under these pots. Yeah, it's like a bath, basically, of water, and then there's a drain there, and the pipes sit on top of that so they can drain from the water. Like that, drain from the water. Okay. Yeah, so here, this is where they are in, in place. So drill out the treated lumber. The trays actually go over it, so it's it fits between like a couple of the deep pots. Um, from a project management standpoint, uh, yeah. like seeing all this, if um, you know we're doing this today with the 800 you know, square foot facility in mind, um, how would you approach like the whole build versus buy? You know. Um, issue of you know spending money for whether it's the you know the structural uh, side of the building um, versus obviously the all the mechanics and storage and plumbing and things that that operate stuff um, and then thirdly I guess you've got the cost for your seeds and you know whatever the natural fish and things you gotta you know, gotta buy but like I guess I'm just wondering how do you get your hands on like, this? What would you 3D print you know, you know today versus what you may have purchased before um, and yeah, like, you know, from, from those three buckets of, like, in infrastructure, operating, mm -hmm. you know, and the natural resources, like, uh, where that that cost breaks down, perhaps, is typically at. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I, in my hand, I have an invisible SD card. Here it is. <laughs> Put this on your 4 by 8 3D printer. Print all the wall modules, fittings, everything, 100%. Oh, awesome. That's the end state. Okay. 
from recycled plastic. That's one way to do it. The thing here is you got to use lump, like including the polycarbonate glazing, plumbing, um, all of that. We're using treated lumber, plastic, soil, and plants. That's the four and, and water. That's the ingredients, but uh, majority of it, the cost is all in lumber and plastic. So if you put some sawdust into your plastic filament, that's like like wood filament printed from trash would be the ideal sol solution. Why? Because that also won't rot. This this stuff will also go away in like even the treated lumber. What's treated lumber rated for? I think it's like 20 years or so. So the plastic would be also be a lifetime design. Now, in terms of like more practically, you can't. The thing is, you can't get a product like this. Nobody sells it. We don't sell it yet. That's that's where I said the enterprise part. Let's sell these as kits, as robust kits. What's the closest competitors? Like, um, I don't keep track of it, but there's some. But they're like they have a part of what what we do. Let's see. Um, it's you can't get this technology off the shelf you might be able to to buy independent parts if it's let's see if that's by any chance something really important like Christian getting materials where where he's coming back from the store right now um, no it looks okay you could get all the sub components but you end up s spending a boatload of money like yeah, like okay, so get this automated watering system, you know, whatever it's gonna be. Here we're doing Arduino and off-the-shelf parts, so probably 10x lower cost. I mean, has anyone looked at what an automated watering system for? But I mean, the complexity here—you're not gonna get this off off the shelf. This is a complex system. You're gonna have to put together so many different pieces, and each one of them has a markup. If you're gonna get a turnkey system, to give you an example. We build the towers, okay, one example, towers. So towers are a main component. You can get them off the shelf for how much? So we go to, uh, once again, to the Aquapana Greenhouse page. We have this fully documented, what's our, and that's actually a good study. So working doc, you go to the, go to the Aquapana Greenhouse main wiki page called Aquapana Greenhouse. So look at the growing towers. So G towers. That's the tubes we use. We make them from PVC. We, uh, we use a Coke bottle. Uh, we make a little slit, heat it with a heat gun, and insert a Coke bottle and make these nice structures, which you can also 3D print if you want to 3D print. Well, what's the bill of materials cost? So that's, you know, you have a description of how you make it. Cost is about $15 per 10-foot tower. That's very low. That includes the reticulated foam growing medium inside, hanging wire, and the pipe. And so I know that the <coughs> competitor for that is ZipGrow towers so what are you gonna get your tower for here so this is a uh, I would actually call uh, I look at it it's uh, I think it's uh, not as good as ours I mean they're doing it from one side we have it like from all sides for one okay but what's what is one of them just as a real real test and they're five feet tall um, zip grow shop. Let's shop. I want one tower. Um, maybe hobby and live sales. I want a tower. <laughs> Oh, well, you could get eight towers for a thousand dollars. Five feet. Uh, how tall are they? Five foot. 
So you get four towers. So do you want to pay sixty dollars or do you want to pay a thousand dollars? That's what we're doing here. Now they also have got maybe like a pump and these ta these troughs at the top and bottom. What would be the the raw tower by itself? Can you even get one? No. No. Can't even get one. So that gives you an idea. 10x to 100x. <laughs> 10x easy. Um, so our greenhouse for the full souped up one uh, we were at we know if the 800 square feet for the structure was like 5,000 bucks because uh, there's a lot of material in there altogether for the other systems probably another 5k for the fully souped up greenhouse 10k perhaps um, we could do way better if we 3d print because that's all lumber and plastic cost plastic like the glazing that costs like 45 bucks or like $90 per one long sheet for one 4 by 16 like 90 bucks close to 100 I mean yeah 3d print from what's the baseline for 3d printing dollar a pound so it's like a few times less ex if you buy the filament like it's actually cost effective to say buy uh, resin like say polycarbonate pellets make filament from that you can make your polycarbonate glazing probably like I don't know maybe like five times cheaper because uh, the question would be how much so t go to Menards and you get the polycarbonate Menards polycarbonate uh, okay say enter well let's go to Menards which, which has readily available clear polycarbonate Menards uh, polycarbonate This stuff, oh uh, yeah, pro we're probably looking at this six foot twin what man. So that's 24 feet, six foot by 24, so 124 square feet. It's about three dollars a square foot, but what's the weight of this? So let's at the bottom line is what is the weight of this thing like I always compare it to okay can I can we make this with our 3d printer uh, what's the weight 38 pounds 40 pounds about four hundred dollars ten bucks a pound get resin from China or some supplier at a dollar a pound so you got 10x cost reduction the electrical cost for printing is negligible so 10x if you 3d print it if you get it from trash it's 10 cents a pound so it's 100x lower so you're talking about that greenhouse being super affordable like if you 3d printed you've got your time but it's less than a thousand dollars in materials it's probably going to be like two hundred dollars in materials uh if it's 10 cents a pound from trash structure is going to weigh if you've got x you know like how many panels we got in that greenhouse um, I don't know 20 it's only like uh, 20 times 100 it's like 2,000 4,000 pounds of material so those are lightweight wall modules say like it weighs two tons altogether well that'll be 400 well two tons 4,000 pounds will be $400 in material from trash so that's the kind of business model we have to be looking at saying we're going from trash we've got the tech and know-how and we can be selling these kits that would be much more than that uh, for the value all the value that's in there if you were to just do the materials yourself it'll already be like the 10k <laughs> but that's if you do the labor yourself and you don't have and these systems don't exist so it's a lot of labor it will be a lot so maybe like two or three times more for your your other parts and labor so economics there's an economic case for this now let's uh, 
what else do we finish with here? So, um, this is what the trays look like. That's all the trays that went into the the, the grow grow trays. Can that we look at? Can we look at that like the tour of the? The old one? Yeah, 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 let's go in there. It's it's in a state of shambles right now. But yeah, let's do that. Let's we can go over there. And in fact, we can go over to the it's 1038 to the other one. So that's that's how I started it. Start all these nuts like this before building those trays. And I knew I had to build them because to water this would be impossible. So you have to do that system and did that um, and can actually grow grow that so that's some some crop <laughs> on a particular day um, yeah that's aphid damage and stuff uh, that's the nuts what you do for the nuts hazelnuts and chestnuts you get to this state in trays and then you plant them um, What else? Yeah, so a lot of this work was... Let's actually add Badger Set Farm, learning from Phil. That's in Minnesota. <coughs> yeah, Katerina? Hedgehog. Hedgehog? What about it? Katerina wants a hedgehog in a well, greenhouse. Yes, this is... Yeah. I was promised a hedgehog like years ago. I'm still waiting for one. <laughs> they they eat pets. What's a hedgehog? Click on that link if you don't want a hedgehog. No, I want one too. Yeah. They're really good uh, for like <laughs> eating all kinds of bugs. <laughs> what do they do? Get three of them. Oh, they eat a lot of bugs. They're actually oh, good. Really? They're a good yeah. pest management thing in a greenhouse. But I'm saying like this is a really in, you know if you soup this all up to a fully integrated system, it's a crazy thing. It's a showcase. Uh, and then for commercial production, you might not have everything, everything, but there's a lot of different ranges of what you can really do. This guy <laughs> got got Photoshop. Um, all right. I, I just I, I just want to let you know also that a baby hedgehog is called a hoglet. <laughs> Google it. You're gonna love it. <laughs> there you go. Aww. <laughs> That's what you shot for. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens on a sunny day when your water system fails immediately. This happens within like half an hour. Huh. I've experienced this, yes. Um, what was this? This was, this is how we were actually fermenting straw for the mushrooms. Because what you do, uh, it's just water. Aero anaerobic like you pack down a bunch of straw and weigh it down and it starts to ferment and smell and then you drain it and that's what you pack in your buckets and put in your spawn and that's how the mushrooms grow the other way to do it that's messy and it takes a few weeks the easy way to do it is use potassium hydroxide so lye so lye put lye water into the straw and you can do it like the next day um, you have to drain the lye Basically, you're killing off all the microbes that are in there. In the case of the fermentation, you're getting the kinds of microbes that the mushrooms compete with so they can actually eat up the straw without, because there's competition there. That's the thing. You got to have clean substrate to make this happen. And this is our cool side of, you know, of our little fishies that come up every time. This is like soon after getting planted, that's that crazy wall of the Chinese cabbage there when it was young. Yeah. Um, this is how our in the pretty times that's our chicken house how it looked. It looks doesn't look good like this but that's where we kept the chickens and it's troublesome because you gotta clean that out. They, they shit a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so underneath you probably want to have warm beds and an effective system to do this. We haven't really figured out how to do that very effectively, but this, this would be really cool that, because I mean that ends up all smiling, but if you have warm beds underneath there and you've got an effective way that all this stuff falls down, that would be a really cool thing, because a thing like this will work, but you have to clean it out all the time. 
that's that's the issue. So just ergonomics of that, that's you know, that's not sustainable if you've got other things to do. Um, There's a soil farmer, Joel Salatin, who like has mobile chicken tractors. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, if you want to fertilize big fields and you just like track the chicken house over a few squares every time. Yeah. Yeah. Move if that were mobile, but in a closed, if you want to do that in a closed space, you probably want to have a chicken door that they climb out. Uh, so that's the <laughs> that's the young dogs when. Uh, yeah, isn't that cool? So that's that's the ones they grow grow grew up by now. Um, but yeah, little look at them. They were little little runts. <laughs> that was the grow bed. That looks just beautiful. All kinds of stuff. Strawberries. Um, what else we got? This was. Uh, that was a hydronic stove. A hydronic stove is kind of like this. So this has got you got this tubing inside the chamber. So this is we built these things. That's actually the one at the faculty house there. Um, but the hydronics would go through this heat and then end up in your tubing that goes into the the ponds. So that's what we did. Um, here's printing net pots and uh, that's how they look like so that's the young plants but a more effective way than just planting in perlite is stick them into the perlite in the pots so you can take the pots out otherwise when you're taking this out all your roots get kind of torn up so plant in per you can do perlite and these net pots perlite by itself it will still work but what we ended up doing is more more of this well this is when we're planting after putting it in the perlite just stick the pots in there so they grow into the pot and saves you a step. Um, yeah, so I would have more than enough of this. So this is local organic from the greenhouse. So that's mushrooms and, and eggs. And this stuff is really good. But yeah, these things look so cool. I mean, they just come up, you drill tiny holes, like half inch, and this huge thing of shroom comes out of it. And that's how it looked. Um, you know, just this harvest like that do they need to be covered or like can they handle no light? once no once once you plant them the part that's sensitive is when you culture the medium once you plant them they're in a closed pot and you just put them in your room like you have one here just put it on the top on the room here and pick in your your shrooms yeah so yeah planting out typically we just did these trays before we hit onto the net pots in the trays and after that the actual pots, uh, deep pots, in bigger trays with things like farm bot, which we haven't done yet. We can do that this time around. So that's what the chicken door looks like from the outside. It was just a flap. With this, you can't do that because if you have raccoons, so these are dead chickens. If you don't have a cl fully closing things at the back, uh, you have to have some kind of an automated door. Uh, that was the faculty house when yeah. we. Were uh, Martin, Martin, that was the chicken door seen from the outside. On the inside, we actually had a sunset, sunrise, uh, oh automatic yeah. door. Huh. It's just it's not visible here, but it's on, on the inside. Yeah. Um, so that's like when you make the towers, you basically draw lines, put cut marks with a with a circular saw, with with a cutoff saw, just lightly, heat gun it, and put a bottle bottle in there to ream it out like that um yeah i mean look at this just crazy uh, making the stoves so you can also culture the mushrooms so here is mu mushroom culture where we inject this has to be sterile though so the idea here is you you make a lid uh, do i show some of that um so the lid that you do, so Peter McCoy showed us, you put some, um, what is that, that rubber, that red rubber caulk, you poke a hole in a lid and you seal it with this uh, rubber, what's it called, uh, the high temperature rubber, silicone, silicone rubber, yes, mm -hmm. uh, you have a lid, you drill a hole in it and seal that hole with silicone rubber, silicone rubber, so that way you have a, a way to sterilize. So you sterilize that, uh, you put, let's see, what do we do there? You have to 
put it into hot w boiling water, then you put on the lid, but you can't open it. So you basically take a needle and inject through that that silicone rubber with a needle as far as the culture. So this is just like sugar water, sugar medium. You inject your your mushroom medium culture and then it will propagate. That propagated medium it will get cloudy so you know you got a lot of mass of fungus in there. That's what you then grow on your substrate. Um, it doesn't need air when it's first. Taken. When you're culturing it, yeah, no air. It just eats the 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 cells propagate. Uh, no air, but the important thing about it is not not letting anything else get in there, any other bacteria or fungus, because you want a pure culture. Um. Yep. Here's how things look when when um, kale s first sprouts um, eggs this is what we had submerged in the actual tank so that's your heater um, yeah this is what you have to do if you're gonna release your fish and you got chloramine in the water you gotta put a few tablets of vitamin C which apparently kills it this is the foam medium we have that for growing um, growing the towers so that's that's when we were first uh, installing those heaters in the in the ponds and the ponds are actually um, where do we go they're actually quite simple it's just polyethylene we used 10 mil polyethylene double layer, folded it up, and that pond is there. It's 21. This was 2015, so for six years it's lasted no problem. This pond here collapsed because uh, too many drain drainings, and uh, because you got this thin divider. Even though you've got these stabilizing wood strips and deep nails into the ground, yeah, the pond will collapse if you drain it because all that pressure from the other pond or from the ground. Um, we tried this. Um, these are th these other worms that grow in. Um, we had this set up here. What's it called? I What's this called? Um, yeah, they're a special worm. That they're a worm that the fish eat. What is it? It's not the red worms. It's another type of worm. But we blood try to worm? grow that. What is it? Blood worm. Um, forget. Katarina, what was that? What was that called? What were the worms called? But well, basically, you have to. This was hard to do. They all died. They all died on us. Um, but the idea there was to grow this. You feed these with. Uh, what do you feed them? I think uh, these are supposed to process like chicken waste. They eat stuff, and then the fish eat them. But they didn't survive. They, we did something wrong. So after some time, it turned into this mess. <laughs> That's all them dying off. Um, we had some little bit of uh, data collection like temperature and humidity. Um, what else? Uh, we had this 3D printed shredder which was supposed to shred biomass for black soldier fly. That's their little larvae living in there. Which we, they basically eat all kinds of waste and food and crap and stuff. So. So this was uh, this carcass here that you see in an old old repository. There. We're building the structure for breeding of the BSF, the black soldier fly, which, as I mentioned, wasn't open source, so we couldn't really do it. Didn't know how to do it. You have to have particular lighting and temperature requirements. But this is how we're making those towers: uh, heat gun plus slits plus bottles. Uh, here's how we were seeding the. This is was the mushroom stuff with Peter McCoy, where that's the fermented straw. And we just load the buckets. You drill. If you look at the buckets, they've got like half-inch holes through them, and uh, you load them up like that. And yeah, the th thing grows like mad. Um, the other part of the greenhouse, we actually put in-ground tubing. So this is actually in uh, Jeff's house greenhouse there uh, for heating. That was the heating of the chicken room. We had that insulated at the bottom, so 
you keep the temperature uh, so yes yeah, so it was a heated greenhouse here's how we did the, the fold of the actual pond it takes a bunch of people to well that I mean it's four feet deep so that has to be like uh, this polyethylene was like 12 feet wide and as long like what was it like 30 feet or so long like these ponds were pretty long so uh, quite deep like four feet and then we're filling them here finally uh, but yeah they're they're insulated so uh, if you're doing tropical fish that's important uh, to keep the heat because the ground is going to be cooling your water off all the time so even in the summer that water is quite cool because it's so deep um, those that's the first greenhouse and you see those stabilizing structures uh, we did the the wood supports yep some more build build pictures and then yeah that's that's the inside the hole so you're just doing this with treated lumber this top edge and then you've got uh, basically these two foot rebars that we stuck into the, the ground to, to hold that together but yeah that was the build um, what else build so we'll do the build so for the build part we'll build a 16 by 16 section it consists of a long part the front and the sides a small angle so you get the water drainage off it um, and that's how it goes like you know same as our house you put those wall modules up and uh, go from there so once again it's a bunch of build a bunch of modules and we can all do them in parallel. So we do we succeed on a lumber mission, Christian? We got some lumber. Yeah. We're gonna do it. It's a sliding miter saw. Uh, the polycarbonate. Let's take a little tour of the old structures and go from there. This is some aerials of the site. So that's the north part. That's that's the Cedica home there, which wasn't there at that time. That's the Cedica home too, like right here. But that's that's where we are from the, the air, and this is when we were building, and that's that's between Hab Lab right there. Uh, and I guess we're still working on faculty house there, and, and the greenhouse was getting built here. Uh, so that's kind of the aerial aerial views here. Of that in progress. It, we wrapped it because otherwise it would be like a mess, a whole mess. Okay. But imagine you could possibly just take the roll as it comes out of the store and I don't know, but you got to separate the tubes a little bit. We found that around the barrel it's a nice heat exchange area. What we did here was, so there's insulation at the bottom, but we did a sim simple stem wall, just a little concrete wall, which we just mixed ourselves. So that's, that's how we did that. Oh, so here's an actual picture of the culture. So you drill for the mushrooms. You put a, a hole, two holes in a lid. One gets air, so actually there is air that gets in there, but uh, otherwise you've got this um, this rubber, silicone, silicone rubber. So that's what you inject to, into with, with the culture using a needle. Uh, but first, this is heated up to high temperature with the, a with the lid off. That's why you need this heat-resistant rubber seal. So you actually cook it in a pot. So this is a way to get a clean room operation on your stovetop for mushroom culture. That's care of Peter McCoy. It's kind he of like he like documented. Canning, right? I mean, similar process. Yeah. It's like canning, except you're injecting things after into the culture. Yep, that's actually uh, the faculty house with hydronic heating under the ground as well. So we're using all this hydronics everywhere. Uh, to hang the greenhouse, uh, we put this ledger on the house. The greenhouse was longer than the house itself, so we had to extend it. Um, that's your forms for the greenhouse itself, for the foundation. 
here's so here's the mushroom process here red RTV RTV silicone high temperature gasket silicone silicone rubber um, this is when we were culturing the, the straw just bags of straw submerged in water for the mushroom medium that's how the polycarbonate came off the truck uh, here's your syringes with culture that's how you inject that and the commonality with today is that the same this is called a lower needle uh, this lower needle with a flat tip is a seed head so if you put a vacuum on it that will pick up one seed one tiny seed so that's what we're, we can do for the we have the materials we, we got this ordered so you can do the seeder off the universal access system that we have for automated seeding so but it's effectively a, a vacuum pump on a needle um, what else uh, in front of it you dump a load of gravel that's the ponds that were dug the two of them in front of the micro house no, no, that's a separate one. Okay. And here's the freak show at a at a at a Mother Earth <laughs> <laughs> Mother Earth event. <laughs> Took that out to demo it, and they said, "What is this freak?" And <laughs> and I said, "Oh, it's a tractor," uh, and just driving it around there. Um, yeah, so that's what these ponds looked like initially dug. So that's backhoe, backhoe work there. This excavator, this kind of a thing. And then a puppy in an excavator. <laughs> <laughs> um, level it, you know the level, level. Insulation was under there. Uh, that's what we do for all our shallow frost protected footers. We put insulation at the bottom so you can get frost heat. It's the equivalent of taking the insulation down in terms of thermal protection. Uh, what else? More nuts. Here's the kind of structure that we built. So the genealogy of this thing is initially we had four foot wide. This is roof glazing. Uh, we put a bar in the middle now because all these little ones well they get all warped up the single one allows you a more firm attachment um, Katrina why do, why do we want a one bar down the middle um, okay so there's a couple reasons one is uh, the one in the middle is like it's a single part like you install it at two points and you're done while these had to be ripped and each one measured and marked individually so it took a lot longer and the other reason too is because as it stands the thing about an attached greenhouse is that because it's so uncommon we don't know where it fits on building codes we don't know if it's going to count as an ad building or as a sunroom or has a porch so uh, with the part down the middle in a header it's basically I think it's close to cl code compliant for if this was a sunroom for example um, hmm. so that's that was the other reason. reason yeah yeah that's a compelling reason initially we had a porch there so you had to take that porch down and put it around the back of the house um, what else? That's Phil Rudder. At ba that's Badger Set Farms. That's the breeding of hazelnuts there in Minnesota where we did that. Um, here's the chickens. So we got all these heirloom chickens for the greenhouse. And that's what grew up in there. And the last one disappeared like this year. <laughs> they escaped or? They we let them out and uh, and then so, so, someone got it. So, what does hydroponics look like? So that's a tiny picture, but this is actually ours. So this is um, oh these are all little tiny pictures. Let's see, no those those are tiny pictures, but what we did do actually is these rafts 
and uh, can I zoom in? Maybe not. But it's that actually. Scroll, scroll. No, it's it's not even scrolling. Okay. What was the uh, the purpose of the, the folding wraps? That's how you hold the lettuce, how it floats on top of the nutrient water. So you drill one inch holes, you plant little plants every so often, and uh, you gotta hold the plant somehow. It can't just be in the water. It rests, the body is above the water, the roots are below water. And aeroponics would be where you have a tight seal between the raft and the container and there's 100% humidity in that, that space where the water would otherwise be. And they say that aeroponics is even more robust, but, well, like faster, even faster, less materials, it's lighter, but, you know, as soon as you poke a hole in that, the plants die. So it's a very non-resilient system, unless you got a tight control over that. Here, it's very hard for the, the plants to die. All the water in a tray would have to evaporate or disappear before that happens. So compared to the watering t the towers, growing towers, if your pump goes out, you're dead in a sunny day in two hours, in a few hours. You might be, like, on a full, full day, you probably won't even recover them. They, they may recover if it's a cloudy day, but like a full, full hot day, um, you can easily kill off your crop in a day, like when your pump fails. Um, so is so so your aquaponic greenhouse have some beds in there have a bunch of variety in there too. Fish will never die there. Like fish will be robust. And uh, let's see what else. I'm sorry. So with the uh, the aeroponics you're talking about versus the hydroponics using the you know the rack, um, with the vertical towers and the uh, you know X Y access universal controller could you just you know time uh, a sprayer you know to yeah you know, sure you can have resiliency like if you're you could have automatic misting or spraying so you can have like a backup where in case that your pump fails you still have backup misting or spraying sure there's many things you can do but just saying if if your pump was the only system like in our system then you're in trouble if it does fail you will always want to design redundancy like for example maybe this time around we have two pumps and uh, we actually alternate between the two so if even if one fails the other one still runs every so often like time it in our system we had the water pump running the whole day it's just drib dribbling down all day you can have it like five minutes every hour you know uh, so here's a close-up picture so the holes with the young lettuce and then the final lettuce it looks amazing you know very clean but you have to sterilize it completely between shots, otherwise you have all kinds of insects. Um, but that that's the picture in the TED talk. I mean, um, so I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. Yeah, so that was the initial greenhouse, which is now the storage shed, uh, like, that's where we had the first aquaponics there. So those, what you see there, is actually tanks, so 55 gallon drums, and we cut a bunch of these drums in half to make our little farm. That's what we did, so you see this bunch of tubing. Uh, so you see a lot of the white drums still have the white, white outlet at the bottom, that was water collection. And so you had these white drums with water and then nutrient medium inside the the barrels. Um, I got a question. Yeah, go ahead. What was your water flow to going through your system that uh, you can calibrate how many gallons per hour? Five gallons minutes? per minute for the the one that we ran for three years. It's just a. It's basically how much does a submersible pump pump out after it gets ten feet of head. So um, the pump, and we have. Uh, yeah, that was the first ever greenhouse. That's er very early, early days. That's the storage shed right now. Um, um, yeah, uh, behind the seed tree. Yeah, yep, there. Um, this is this is what it looked like when we arrived. 
You only <laughs> had a chicken house on the site? <laughs> it was a soybean field. This is like where the the Sea Eco Home 3 is like right now. <laughs> uh, what's this? What's this? Um, yeah, that's... Oh. Yeah, early days, not not super relevant. But we did have so when we had this aquaponics, sorry, hydroponics. So that's this was in Osborne, ten miles south of here. But this is what we did. This is that was the very first when you saw those nice trays of aquaponic lettuce that I took to market. Uh, that was in here. Um, yeah, pictures. Yeah, that's it. Uh, let's see. That's. Where is that? That's somewhere else. But yeah, uh, so that's a pictor pictorial view. Maybe we should go out there and take a look at the existing structures which we can learn from and then get into the build because today we want to build how many people we got here to build. We got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve people. Um, but so that's the structure. <clears throat> These are four by sixteen, four roof modules. These are all the sidewall modules, and there's a little riser at the back to get a little slope. We could even avoid the riser if, I mean, it wouldn't take the snow, it actually would take the snow loads even, because the panels, the way we're making them, they're structural, they're, they're actually quite structural. We probably want to do a little riser on the back. Uh, the idea is like, let's build this uh, as far as a fully enclosed greenhouse structure. Uh, we need a door. Uh, put the door on the side. Initially, we had the door. Uh, so, modular greenhouse system. What's it look like? Here's here's kind of what we have. Um, what we're doing. So, there's different. Why is this not coming up in there? This is what we've got, the, the effectively. So we're going to build this, effectively. You can build all kinds of shapes. Uh, longer. Well, 16 foot, starting by s with 16 by 16, or even 16 by 4 if you run a long, thin greenhouse. Because it comes in sections of 4 feet wide. You can make it as long as, as you want. But something looks like this. But not. Don't put the door on the front. That's not convenient if you're growing, having growing shelves on the front. So put it on the side. That's better. Uh, if you want to take a look at what that looks like, we have the uh, Sweet Home 3D that you can download. So you can open this up if you want. Um, where did that go to? So you can open it up if you want to uh, open with Sweet Home 3D. So you can uh, take a virtual tour, but a stem wall in the back, all eight foot panels in the front and sides, make one door. So that's it. We got the um, the lumber. So the first step would be four by eight, four by eight modules like we've always done. Uh, we can do one that's got the opening. Uh, let's do like four that maybe two and two, two that have openings, two that don't. We actually have, the, the way we have the glazing is it's designed for a uh, six foot and then two foot opening at the bottom. So we have six foot and two foot pieces. We have some eight foot pieces. They're already cut. We're actually using them from, uh, reusing them from Katarina's uh, workshop. We actually have to take four sheets off the roof actually of the polycarbonate so maybe we can start building this um, and maybe a couple of us can grab the sheets uh, so we can do the framing just four by eight so cut down 
cut panels that are four by eight. Uh, we've got lumber that's wh okay. What what is the roof? It's actually two by eight, two by eight lumber. Um, and it's got three. This is the old design, so this this is no longer good. The new design is. Let's go down here. This is the new design. This, the, the, the one down the middle, that's for the roof. Uh, we can do, uh, to keep it things simple, I mean, we can go through building. It's, it's the, the openable door, openable window. That takes a little bit of time. What we can do right now is we can simplify this design by running this bar all the way up. So we have 16 footers, so three 16 footers, <coughs> two four footers, done. We can retrofit the window. Here we have a complex window design, which is, uh, we'll see it on the old greenhouse. We can take a look at it. So you'll see this exactly as built. You'll see these things as built in the CD Home 1. So these two are the modules of interest. And we want to do a door. Door we can, um, yeah, uh, it's a uh, glazed door. It actually gets more detail than these modules. But right now we can build out these modules. There's a whole bunch of them actually. Because look how what the, how the numbers add up. Uh, four four roofs. Is there four by eight? 16 walls but they're quick they're they're six screws five minutes not uh, you got to come to size but each one of these is effectively like look at this can we make 16 of these and four of these today and put them up stand them up yep yeah <laughs> let's do it don't worry about the bottom we'll retrofit the bottom we have uh, for this we have Step one, these frames, four by eight, four by 16. With the middle Two side? by six, yes. Mm -hmm. So that this will be code as a sunroom, for example, if we got to do this, because this is a, an add-on to the CD cajon. We can put it in front of that one right now, except we don't want to because that structure is not water protected. All that lumber is going to start rotting. So we're not going to do that. We're going to do a standalone, which is a good experiment in a more modular structure. If you want to pop this up in your backyard, how, e how easy is it? Which is good. So. Add the crossbar later. No, crossbar. Oh, yeah, crossbar. Yeah, yeah. We can do one without. Yeah, we can retrofit it as two pieces. Let's, let's just get the structure up. It will be quite rewarding. And you'll have a very. Like once it starts actually getting cold, cold here, you'll see how the thermal gain works in a greenhouse. In the middle of winter, it's like 80 or 90. Like it could be like quite cold out, and you got 80s, even 90 in, indoors, uh, which is uh, pretty amazing. Like in the winter, you get your little fruit, fruit and salad. It's pretty good. A little tropical rainforest cool. in the back. Indeed. Now, what are we going to do with this? So we're going to we're going to seed it, seed this up. And the people who are staying here are going to see the, the bounty. People who aren't, you're not going to see much growth in three days. <laughs> Say again. <laughs> we'll, send them we'll send them pictures of or a hopefully <laughs> very juicy towers dripping with lettuces and plants. What are your things that we're going to grow? We're going to grow a bunch of, a bunch of stuff. So, um, top, so let's look at this list of top, top aquaponic uh, plants. Do you intend to grow vine uh, vegetables like tomatoes, peppers? Okay. Yeah. Would those grow yeah. out of towers or do they have their own? Uh, Not towers. Okay. Best plants for aquaponics that grow extremely well in the tower medium. So not talking about soil. Soil gets you everything. I got all of this. We got all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, not all of it. We don't have we don't have cher uh, strawberries, but we've got lettuce, basil, kale, bok choy, and about there's a whole bunch of Napa cabbage, Chinese vegetables that are, that grow really well. 
<laughs> Collard greens, mustard greens, mescaline salad, cilantro, strawberry. We don't have strawberry. Dill, parsley, spinach, watercress, arugula, Swiss chard, bok choy, kale, basil, lettuce. Watercress, that's awesome too. Um, strawberry spinach. What's that? Strawberry spinach. I don't know. Uh, I didn't get it. But is it, it, it like spinach, what you need is hot, hot when it's hot because the other spinach when it's cool is when it does the same. The Melba spinach is the Okay. Malibu spinach? Melba. Melba? Melba. Mm -hmm. So put it at 17, Melba spinach, because in the summer that's going to get hot. And this is the exactly the kind of stuff we got to figure out. What exactly grows well in what conditions under the conditions we have, which is the towers. Nobody mm -hmm. knows that. Nobody shares that openly. So, uh, that's Melba a spinach. Looks like there's a 17, 18, and 19 about midway through the list. And there, there are a lot of them. I would think that uh, uh. on my greenhouse, after I learn how to kill it, I'm going to actually grow the plants that are for the insects. Yeah, so, that's exactly uh, right. You want to do that? Marigold and dill. Exactly. So you, I'm going to have that, like all the different. That's exactly right. That's called companion planting or beneficial plants where they attract the insects that eat the other insects. Right. So, uh, once again, this kind of a system is an integrated complex biological system with pest management built in, all kinds of critters, in addition to the actual plant. It's an ecosystem. And, uh, yeah. Um, so you can use this, use this page to put up more things that succeed well. But we know lettuce grows like crazy, so does basil and kale and bok choy, uh, Swiss chard. Arugula we haven't done, but apparently grows, no, actually we did, yeah, we did, yeah, that grows well. Spanish grows well. Watercress apparently is super easy, and that's a nice, nice plant. Cilantro uh, does. Like that would be in soil. Uh, but you can do your, your beds of, that's where you have the growing beds. Um, the strawberry does, um, I mean, that's without, not soil, that's just like in the medium. Cabbage. You believe cabbage? I mean, that, that could be these fat heads hanging off your... Imagine that. But apparently it grows really well in a system like this, not not even soil. So so that's you know keep adding to that page. That's a that's a good page. It sounds like strawberry spinach is the is a variety that grows well in the cool. So uh for strawberry spinach wait, so Melba spinach, what's strawberry spinach? It has strawberries growing on the same bank with the uh, spinach. Really? Oh like you can eat the strawberry leaves like the yeah. spinach? What? 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 <laughs> that sounds like internet. <laughs> <laughs> Strawberry spinach. I don't know. Yeah, the word salad in there. Strawberry spinach salad? No, but you put salad in there. In this search bar. Your search bar here has salad. On a suggestion. <laughs> uh, what are the strawberries? How do they taste? Are they? <laughs> that is insane. <laughs> oh my. The thing is about this, like you think you've seen everything and then you'll see something completely crazy and it's like the best thing. <laughs> I'm telling you, like it happens all the time. <laughs> Strawberry spinach. Is it natural or do you no, know? No, it looks, it's looks fine. It's mulberries, so it's not actual strawberry. Huh. It does look like mulberries, yeah. But well, we don't know We oh, don't okay. know if okay. it grows well in aquaponics, though. Uh, so, so possible. Others. Oh, yeah, ground cherry. So ground cherry. Um, but I'm actually, we didn't do it in the towers. We did it in the soil, so maybe... Maybe, I don't know if, if that works well there. Um, 
So strawberry spinach, man. But just for the looks, that gets. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> I am one uh, of children. Yeah. <laughs> strawberry spinach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so best plants. But okay, we're building these things. So maybe let's go out there. Let's see what else uh, we can talk. We can cover more theory tomorrow because there's plenty more to talk about. But let's go out there. Just just walk through and. Uh, We'll just walk up there and see what we got. So they'll end the in-house session.